morning. How are you this morning? You're just okay? Excited? I'm excited that you're here with the new baby. The sky got to come back. If you haven't seen the new baby yet, please visit with the new baby after church. Little Maverick, he's here in the world, keeping Brandon up all night. That's a good thing. Does he? <laughs> well, maybe not forever. We'll see. <laughs> if you would, open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians 5. Um, today, you can kind of see from the title, since we're on the, on the verge, you know, we're at the precipice, we're at the end of one year, and we're about ready to go over the hill. It's like being on a roller coaster, right? The whole year's been building up and building up and building up, and now we're at the top, and now the new year's coming. We're, we're ready to go down that hill on a new year and see what the new year brings. Well, here at church, at least people of God, we, we don't look at life like, hey, what will we accomplish next year in this world? We look at life to see what will we accomplish in the kingdom of God, for Christ, for God. How will we glorify God with our lives moving into the new year? And then what will we do? So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it's, I think we have a good opportunity to reflect on a lot that's going on with us, how we've been transformed, what we are to be, how we are to live, and the fact that we are new creations in Christ, which is going to become clear throughout the passage. I, I hope you're ready to engage this morning and not just fall asleep, because if you do go to sleep, you're going to miss a great opportunity to reflect and to think about the things that God has said and that He has done. Um, today, one year ends, and tomorrow, one begins. You're going to have, if the Lord gives it to you, and again, none of us are promised tomorrow, so I can't promise you you'll have tomorrow, but assuming that the Lord gives each of us 2024 and we have all 365 days, you're going to have the exact same amount of time as me, the exact same amount of time as the person sitting beside you, assuming that the Lord allows us all to make it through 2024, you cannot look at your life and say, well, I just didn't have enough time. I just didn't have the opportunities. Because as we sit here today, tomorrow is a brand new day. The Bible tells us to think about today, right? And worry about the troubles today, not tomorrow necessarily. But as we prepare to live out the next year, I hope the preparations of today and finalizing whatever it is in your life today will be enough to set you on a course tomorrow for growth in Christ for real ministry, for real service. No longer just a service of, oh, well, I do a few things for God. No, but you wake up every day, I hope, in the new year, and you say, God, what do you want from me today? What do you want from my life? What is your will for my life today, God, each and every day? Not what plans you have and all the goals that you can write down. But God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? What do you want me to study? What do you want me to pray about? I want you to think about your life in that way. And I hope the new year for each one of us brings a day, the day in and out just like that. We wake up, God, what do you want for my day? What do you need me to do? I'm here to serve the king. I'm here to live in the kingdom, for the kingdom, even though we know the kingdom on the earth isn't fully here yet. We don't have the Lord on the throne yet here. We will one day. But we are still sharing the gospel and we are still pressing people into the kingdom through the ministry. People are still being pressed into it. Is that how you live? Because I fear if we do what we did this year, well, the results are going to be the same, isn't it? Here's the big question. If you continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, don't they have a clinical definition for what that is? <laughs> you might say insanity, you might say crazy, 
When you do the same thing over and over and you expect different results each time you do it, you kind of have to consider yourself to be a bit either insane or crazy. <laughs> so a Christian who thinks that they're going to be something different, yet they live the same way day by day by day by day, you're going to have to call yourself a little bit crazy. But you can change it. And, and that's the great thing about tomorrow. That's the great thing about the future. If the Lord gives it to you, you don't have to do tomorrow what you did today. You don't have to live 2024 the way you lived 2023. If the Lord allows, if the Lord gives you the year, you can live it for Him. Completely, totally sold out to the max, to the full. The abundant life that Jesus promised, you can have it. Let's pray together and then we'll get into this text. And I'll quit droning on. Hopefully the text itself will help you to understand these things. This is, this is a really important text. And I think most of you know it only because of verse 17, most likely. But I want you to get familiar with the whole argument, if you will, that Paul is making here. So let's pray. Father, you are a wonderful God. We are truly thankful that you have counted us worthy to be saved, to be part of the kingdom of God, part of the household of faith. Father, in relationship with you and at peace with you through the blood of your son and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we pray today that you would be glorified in all that we say and do, in all that we think, in all that we imagine to do. Father, in all of the things that we set as goals, we pray that you would be at the center of each. That, Father, you would give us wisdom from your word. You would help us see today whether we are serving well or whether we aren't serving well. That, God, you would give us insight into the fact that when you've saved us and you've placed your Holy Spirit in us, there's an expectation of the behavior that will come with the Holy Spirit in our hearts. God, give us wisdom to see. We pray that you will touch our hearts. And if anyone sitting here, Father, or listening to this or watching this, if they do not know Christ, I pray that you would save them. The Father, they would hear the gospel clearly proclaim that Jesus is the way, truth, and the life, and that no one comes to you except through him. And Father, that they would believe that, and then as a believer, they would walk in a holy way, in a righteous way. And each of us in the church of God would put on that righteousness and that holiness which has been imputed, and that would be our daily life living in the good works that you before ordained that we should walk in them. So, Father, we ask for your help in this. We know we are weak according to the flesh. We are sinful. We are rebellious. We are way more selfish, Father, than we would ever admit to anyone. And so, God, we pray for your help to get rid of self, to put self aside and not live for self, but that even in spite of the weakness of our flesh, we would live for you. And so we pray this and Father, I pray that you would bless each of those who have come out this morning to hear and to worship and to celebrate the, the coming of the Lord, but also to celebrate the coming of a new year that can be lived for the Lord. And Father, I pray that you would bless them greatly because again, at least a step to get up and to come and to be counted and to praise and to worship has been done. So Father, I pray for blessing for the small steps that will lead to even greater faithfulness. You're an amazing God. Father, we praise you for the many things you've done this week that um, each one of us, I'm sure, have experienced things that you have done in our lives. And Father, we may not even know of each one's joys that we have from what you've done, but we pray, Father, thanking you for them. We pray for the ministry of the gospel that each one of us might take it to the world that we might take it out into the darkness and find the deepest, darkest places and to shine the light very brightly in those places. Father, help us to see them because some of them are right under our nose. 
Some of them are right in our families or in our neighborhoods or in our workplaces. Help us to see them and to spend time sharing and ministering the gospel, the light to the world. Father, we pray for blessing as we do it. We pray that you'll continue to grow our church and bless our church. And we pray that we would be faithful until the Lord comes, which we saw in the book of Revelation. We know the Lord is coming quickly. The Lord is not hastening his return, but as things wrap up on this earth and the last Gentile is saved, we know that the Lord is going to come and take his church. And so, Father, I pray that we would be ready. We love you and praise you. Again, we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. And Father, we pray that you would be pleased with our worship and that you would accept it. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's read. I'm going to read the entire passage, and I'm actually going to read down into verse 2 of chapter 6. So we're going to read this entire chapter. And I'd like to read it before I start to preach any of it. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that we are at home in the body, or sorry, while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad knowing therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men but we are well known to God and I also trust are well known in your consciences for we do not commend ourselves again to you but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not imputing their trespasses to them. And has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so we have a great statement here given by Paul to the church at Corinth. 
And he'll recall the first book to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, if you're familiar with that book. This was a church that had a lot of error. They had a lot of problems. They had a lot of things that needed to be corrected. And in Paul's first writing to them, he corrected many. But in this second one, he is encouraging them quite a lot. And he gives them this statement here. And Did you notice how many things you quote <clears throat> or consider quoting you think about in your mind that came out of chapter 5? There are many things we say that come right out of this chapter. They're standard things. You know, today is the day of salvation. It's something that we say quite a bit. Here it is. It comes from this very passage. This is the kind of thing that we need to think about, and we need to focus on what Paul is saying. So let's start with his argumentation here at the beginning and see if we can't unfold some meaning that will help us to move our lives in a different direction than what we have in the past. To live our lives not, no longer for ourselves. Did you notice that in there? That we should no longer live for ourselves? Did you, did you catch the words? That we should live for God. And so let's start at the beginning. Verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, and again he's talking about the body just so we're clear, if this earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we know, believers, right, that we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We have, and we are waiting on, aren't we? Many of us are waiting, and if you notice down through here, in fact, it describes it like we are groaning waiting for the coming of this new body. We don't want to be the sinful, fleshly, worldly thing that we are today. We want to have that heavenly, or I should put it in these terms, we don't want to be the mortal that we are today. We don't want the pain and the suffering and the hurt. We don't want all of that. We want the thing that's coming, but yet it takes death to deliver the spiritual, doesn't it? See, the spiritual doesn't come first. The, the worldly or the earthly, as we read there, comes first. But we have this building, and believers have great hope that there is something better than the current state. Is that a hope you have? Well, three of you, four of you maybe. It's hard for me to tell for sure if it was three or four. But at least a few of you are hoping. Does that mean the rest of you are unbelieving? Or does that just mean you're, you're too tired to say, oh yeah, way to go. I'm excited. Yay. That's what it sounded like to me. Why, why don't we hear a roar? Yes, we can't wait for the new body. Eternal life. A new body. Let me read this to you. So from 1 Corinthians chapter 15... We actually get a great description of this. Let, let me read it to you because it's some of what's in my mind and I want to make sure I say the words for you because I keep bringing things into it that really did, it didn't say in this passage. But it does in 1 Corinthians 15 because this building and house is from God. Now listen what this sounds like because our future body is eternal. It's immortal. Hear these words. This is 1 Corinthians 15 starting in verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And you guys remember that, right? God breathed life into Adam when he created him. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now that's referring to Jesus. Adam, the physical Adam, was the first Adam. That's where we inherited death and corruption and all that stuff through his sin nature. We have one. But the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now this is Christ. Christ became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's amazing, isn't it? And that's quite the contrast. Who would you rather be like, the man of dust or the Lord from heaven? <laughs> as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Oh, this is great. 
Because each one of us who descended down from Adam, we're just like him. We're subject to corruption and all the things that you can think of, weakness, but not on the heavenly side. Imagine the Lord Jesus in his eternal state, the Lord from heaven. He's incorruptible. You can't corrupt the Lord from heaven. Incorruptible. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now somebody better say amen to that. All right, eight of you. We're getting better. We've doubled the number. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. There we go. And I didn't even have to prompt that one. Now we're really cooking with gas. Do what? This is good. But at the last trumpet, this corruption is going to put on incorruption. If you belong to Christ, you are going to get the body of a heavenly, immortal, celestial being. No longer a person of dust, a person of the earth. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. Notice that. The dead will be called up out of the ground. And they will be given a body, but it won't be the body they had before. Remember, that body's coming up out of the ground corrupted. And we're coming up off the earth. Let's assume it's today or tomorrow. I'm not saying it is, but that would be great. The dead will go up first. Then we who are alive and remain are called up. And then we're all changed. The old body, dead in one case, sort of living in our case, but changed into this new incorruptible thing. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this, incorru- when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Do you know what that means? That means that this new incorruptible body cannot die, will not die. So the death you might experience in your physical body today, the body of the earth, the mortal body, the body of the first Adam, it can die. It can be laid in a grave, and it can stay there until the Lord calls it back up out of that grave. But this new one doesn't die. Doesn't die. Death is completely swallowed up in victory. That is amazing, isn't it? We have a natural body now, but one day believer, and this belongs to the believer. This isn't every single human being. There will be a resurrection even for unbelievers, but it's in another place in the Bible, and it refers to a time when you'll stand at a great white throne judgment, and if you are found to be not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone. That's after your body is resurrected, your soul put back together, and you are there, a person again, still in the corruptible body, however. But believer, that's not you. You have a new body, a new time when this is going to be transformed, and you will be something different. But we go back to 2 Corinthians 5, and He goes on to say, in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation from heaven. Now, this word habitation, by the way, it only appears twice in the New Testament. It's the word oiketerian. You ever heard that word oiketerian? It only appears in two places. It appears here, and it appears once in the book of Jude. I'm going to read you the verse so that you can can kind of level set with how it's used there, because it's not used of Christians there. Listen to how it's used. This is Jude. Jude only has one chapter, by the way. It's verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, or oiketerian, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day, of the great day. See, somehow angels, and this is the Genesis 6 thing that you're familiar with, or some of you are familiar with, angels left heaven, took the form of men, 
and procreated with human women and created something that are called in, in the Old Testament the Nephilim. It, but this, they left their spiritual or heavenly body. Now how that works, I have no idea. I'm not an angel, never been to heaven. I know, I know a lot of pastors are supposed to go to heaven night and day, but they, it's not true. Some say they do. I don't believe any of them. But I've never been to heaven. I don't know what an angelic body is like. I don't know its capabilities. But somehow they're able to put it aside and put on like humanity almost. The form of humanity anyway. To the point where they can procreate with human women and create offspring. Jude uses that same word that we're talking about, that Paul is talking about with us this oiketerian, this habitation from heaven. We're earnestly desiring to put that thing on. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying we're becoming angels. But this word means that there is a different kind of habitation that we do not have today. A, a clothing. A, again, it's using the word of clothing here, if you notice in and out of these verses. We have a type of clothing on today that's corruptible. It's subject to weakness. It's subject to futility. But the new one will not be. The new one will not be able to die. It won't be able to be corrupted. I would Now, this is just a guess, but I would assume it doesn't have the same pain structure that we have. Now, I'm sure it has sensitivities and things like that, but exactly how it works, I don't know. But it is a heavenly habitation that we do not possess today, but we are waiting to be clothed with this thing. And in fact, it says, we groan earnestly waiting. Do you, are you tired of being in the corruptible, pain-ridden, weak body that you have today? Would you rather trade it out for a new model? An incorruptible model? A model with eternal life? No death? Oh, I can't wait. We don't sound very excited as, about it as a group, though. But we do groan. We earnestly desire. And he says, we groan not wanting to be unclothed. And understand what he's saying here. We don't want our, our body to be gone. Uh, imagine, you know, because so, some, and I think Gnostics, you know, they, they, never, they didn't believe in like a spirit kind of thing at all. They only believed in the physical. But there's this weird thing. Some people have this idea that, you know, maybe it would be better to throw the physical out altogether and just be spiritual so that you don't have a flesh to contend with at all. You don't have a physical container, but you're just spirit. Now, I don't know if we would want that. I don't think that would be the best way to exist. Because again, our physical bodies seem to be the way we interface with things. The problem we have is that our physical body is a corrupt one. It's a sinful one. It's a fleshly one that wars with the spiritual nature of who we really are. And so we groan, not wanting to have our I don't know whether to call it a body or a container, not to have it thrown off, to be unclothed entirely and our soul just be bare, wandering around, floating around as an ethereal spirit kind of thing. That's not what we want. What we want is to be further clothed. We want the enhanced version of this. How many of you want the body that Jesus had after he resurrected from the dead? Can you recall some of what he was able to do? Remember, he's in that heavenly or spiritual body. Remember, he, he walked as a human man. He put on the flesh. Now, he wasn't a sinner. He never sinned. But he still had human flesh wrapped on his body. He went, made his way to a cross. It died. That's how you know he was fully human, because his body died. If he had the heavenly on, he couldn't have died. But he died... His eternal spirit, if you will, or soul we call it, obviously that never dies. And he's God, so that's a very different thing. But his physical body, when he came back to life, however, he had a different type of body. 
In fact, there, if you notice, he walked to Emmaus. Do you remember that? He walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus, about a six-mile walk or so, I think, if I've heard that right, six or seven-mile walk. And he talked to disciples, and they didn't even know who he was. And they ask him, where have you been? You haven't heard about what's going on, the things that have taken place here in our day? And he's like, no, what things? Why don't you tell me? Of course he knew and he had heard, but they didn't even recognize him. He also was able to eat with the spiritual body. He was able to walk through either the wall or the door when it was locked. He came right into a room without opening the door. Would you enjoy being able to walk right through the wall? That hassle of opening the handle, being able to walk right in? Yeah, we groan wanting this. We want mortality to be swallowed up by this new life. This new life in Christ. This eternal promise of God to have an inheritance which includes a different kind of body. This is huge. And then look, he says, he says, now, this is verse 5, now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. (laughs) So what about that conversation about losing your salvation? Mm. That's a weird conversation, isn't it, in light of a verse like this? I want you to know that that word guarantee, it's only used three times in the New Testament, and every single time refers to the Holy Spirit being given as a guarantee of an inheritance to come. Folks, most of you know, and we preach it and teach it all the time, you can't lose your salvation. Let, Let me read to you these other verses, because God's Holy Spirit has been given to a believer as an earnest... Or we can say the word guarantee as long as you understand what that means. But if I say something like an earnest or a down payment on an inheritance, that helps you to understand, right? What happens to that guarantee in the case of a house? If you put down earnest money, what happens to that if you back out of the deal? (laughs) All right, but normally what happens and. That's more of a modern thing, but yeah. But normally, if you put 1000 or 5000 down on a home to say that, look, I'm buying it, here's my guarantee that I'm going to get the financing for the rest of it or the money for the rest of it, if you back out, you'd lose it, wouldn't you? But see, God doesn't take away His Holy Spirit ever. Once He gives it, it's yours to keep, as in that transaction. The earnest money is yours to keep. The guarantee has been made, and it is eternal, and it is permanent. Listen to this. This this came before in a chapter we didn't read, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is verses 21 and 22. He says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us, I'm sorry, and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Does that make it even clearer? He sealed us with the Holy Spirit, giving us Him in our hearts as a guarantee, a down payment, an earnest promise on. Now, listen, and this is the one that I always refer people to. It's the one that sticks out the most in my mind in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, In Him, you, this is starting in verse 13, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That one puts it in clear terms, doesn't it? You trusted, he gave the Holy Spirit, and you have him now as a guarantee on an inheritance that God has set aside that will come about at the redemption of your bodies. You will receive the inheritance or the future body, the thing we're talking about, this new heavenly state, it is promised to you. You haven't received it yet. You're not yet sitting in the glorified body, right? If I use those terms. That's easier terms for us to understand. 
You're not sitting in that glorified body that we await, that we are groaning and, and longing for earnestly. But you will. And it will come at the time when your body is redeemed. Because, see, we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ to be in relationship with God, redeemed from our old sins. We're dead to those, and now we're in newness of life, redeemed. But the body itself has not yet been redeemed. If you still have the possibility of sin and death in you, then you haven't been redeemed yet. Your body, physically. But it will happen. And when it does, you will see that the Holy Spirit was a promise and a guarantee of those things. He is inside of us now, guaranteeing and sealing us until the day of redemption. That's Ephesians 4.30, by the way. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. So with all of this stuff, why can people have an idea that you could lose salvation? Is God a liar? Here, I'll give you my Holy Spirit for a time, but then I'm going to take him away. And then I'll give him back to you. And, and then I'll take him away again. Eternal life wouldn't be eternal life, would it? It'd be conditional life, and it would be on the condition that you do what I say. Is that how salvation works? No, because if you'd follow on in Ephesians into chapter 2, you'd find out that it's not by works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is secure and believer. You have hope. You should be smiling from ear to ear about the hope that is coming to you if you are truly Christ. Then he moves on and he says that we are home in the body, or sorry, being home in the body is to be absent from the Lord. And now he's talking more about the spirit or the soul that lives in us. If you think about that, as our soul is home in this physical flesh, in this body, we're absent from the Lord, aren't we? Where's the Lord right now? Where, where does the Lord sit right now? Yeah, at the right hand of the Father is what we're told. He's sitting in heaven. He is our advocate, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and He is advocating on our behalf right now. He's not here with us, is He? And we certainly aren't there with Him. Any of you been to heaven? Even in dreams or anything? Okay. Well, then we're on the same page. But one day, when we are absent from this body, guess where we'll be? Because he goes on to say, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Once the soul leaves the body, it doesn't just wander around on the earth. I know some have that idea. Some have that opinion that your soul leaves your body and it just wanders around as a ghost on the earth. It's not true for a believer. And according to the rich man and Lazarus story that Jesus told everyone, it doesn't happen with the unbeliever either. Because he immediately went to be in torment, the rich man. Lazarus went to be, well, he went to the good side of Hades, but as Christ resurrected, he took him to heaven. Now he's in heaven. Then he goes on, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Is this true of you, or are you always trying to walk by sight? Because a, a Christian has to walk a bit by faith, don't we? Can you see Jesus? How do you know Jesus ever lived? How do you know Jesus is the real Savior? It takes faith, right? It takes faith. Now, there's tons of evidence. Don't get me wrong. I'm not mocking anything. This Bible, the Christian faith, the very fact that people still believe and trust in Christ is pure evidence that He is real, that He lived, that He died, that He is the Savior. There's tons of evidence, but you can't lay hold of Him right now, can you? Can you show anyone a picture of Jesus, an actual picture? Not one of those Catholic pictures or, you know, somebody's, you know, form that showed up in a tree on the wood that's supposed to be Jesus or maybe Mary. Can you show anyone an actual picture of Jesus? Oh, I was hoping that what you'd say was you could see him on the Shroud of Turin, but whether you believe in the Shroud or not doesn't matter. You still believe by faith because God has changed your heart and he has taught you the truth of who Jesus is. 
but you can't see him. And there are many things that you, that you take by faith. Is that true? But we walk in a spiritual way by faith. Our world tells us to be skeptical of everything that we can't see, that we can't put our hands on. The problem with that is it's nonsense. I mean, I want you to think about how good we are at observing what's right in front of us. Are you very good at it? You may say, well, I'm an expert at looking at everything, and I never miss anything. And then we have an illusionist, right? Like a David Blaine or someone stand in front of us and take out a deck of cards. And he makes us believe things we know good and well couldn't have just happened with those cards. Because of his, he's fast and he can move your, your attention to another place and do something right in front of you that you didn't even see him do. And then we'll be like, oh, he must be demon possessed. And maybe some of those illusionists are. Chris Angel, I wonder. He's very dark. But no, they can fool us very easily. Just look at what Satan does every single day. See, this is where the, this is where the sermon pivots. This is where we go from, hey, this was really exciting to, I really don't like this guy anymore. Because it pivots, because Satan does this every single day. He tells you you're okay living your life for you however you want. Every single day he tells you you're fine just the way you are. You're just fine. The truth is found in you. That you're okay. You can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Everything's going to be okay. You just got to do what you know is best for you. Every day. And Satan has even the church captivated by this nonsense. I'll get up. I'll live my life the way I want to live it today. I don't care what God says. And you would go, you, if I were talking to you one-on-one, you would say, I would never say that. Oh, I know you'd never say it. I wouldn't either. I'm not talking about what we say. I'm talking about how we lived. <laughs> it's pretty clear that Satan convinced us that we could do anything we wanted with our day. And most days, that's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we do. I, I'm going to ask you a series of well, I'm going to make a series of statements, and I just want you to connect them with your own life. Don't, don't put this on someone else. I want you to put it on you for a minute. How many of the following things are a daily practice in your life? You, not the person beside you, not your kids, not your mom, not your brother. You. Bible reading and study. Now, I said daily. Daily. Prayer, serving others, sharing the gospel, fellowshipping with the body of Christ. Now, I'm going to cut it off at five. I could go on, obviously. We could go on and on for hours here. Just those five. Those are like the very basic foundation of a Christian's life, according to biblical texts. You know, I'm summing up and wrapping up a whole bunch of Bible doctrine there. Those five things right there, and how many of you are even doing them daily, if you're honest? And I'll say us. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to exclude me. I'm, I'm right in there with you. How many of us are doing them daily? So let me give you the other list. Maybe it'll comfort you, but I hope it hurts. I hope it stings. I hope it feels like a pitchfork is being stabbed in your back. If not those things, the spiritual things, the biblical things, what is your time spent on? And I'll, I'm going to give you a list of five because I think these are probably the top five. Your job, your stuff, your family, your pleasure, and your hobbies. Now, if you were to sit down with just the ten things we listed there, five for God, five for you, and you are to be honest, and you on a piece of paper just put two columns, just divide the sheet in half, and then in two columns, you write the activities of the average day. There. Which five would have the larger list, if you're honest? 
You see what I mean? I think right there proves to every single one of us that Satan is doing this right now and he lives in your head because he's captivated our minds somehow to say it's okay to live however we want and the consequences don't matter. God's okay with me if I don't do all those things every day. I only need to do them occasionally. When, when I feel really spiritual. Brothers and sisters, are there any times when you feel really spiritual? I mean, I would say there's probably a few here or there. But not most days. Most of the time you're struggling the same way as the rest of us. You're, you're upset, you're frustrated, you're hurt, you're tired, you're worn out. Potentially even exhausted from whatever's come in life. Acting like you're going to feel up to living spiritually? No way. And I didn't take the time to ferret it all out. You can. Paul spent a lot of time in prison or in chains or in beatings or in stonings or being mocked. Do you think it was easy for Paul to walk in a spiritual way under that kind of abuse? No, and it, it wouldn't be easy for you either unless you've already determined and you've started to do that as a regular pattern of life. This is why I titled it, Will You Live Differently in the New Year? This doesn't have anything to do with God. This is, it's not God's fault that you're not walking for God every day. I'm, and I'm talking to believers here. An unbeliever, your one and only job right now is to believe on Him whom God sent, Jesus. If you're an unbeliever. That is your one and only job. And then from there we can teach you how to obey the rest. But believer, it's not God's fault if you're being disobedient to Him. That's your fault. It's your responsibility to do what God said. To take that list of five we started with and implement those on a day-to-day -day basis. And to become the spiritual person that you are supposed to be. Not the spiritual person you want to be. Because if you leave it as just a desire, it'll never happen. That means you have to wake up tomorrow or even go home today and say, hey... Today starts my prayer life. Not my occasional praying when I feel like it. My prayer life. If you are ever going to change, it's only going to happen when you are willing to be honest with yourself about who you are and what you do with your time. Now, I know you may feel like, hey, well, Rodney, he's doing something the text isn't doing. No, the text did that. And if you don't believe me, just look at the next statement. Look at verse 9. It's the exact argument Paul is making here. He just did it in fewer words. He's a better speaker than I am. It takes me a lot of words to make a statement. It took him a few but look at verse 9. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. The goal of one's life is not pleasure. It's not your job. It's not your stuff. It's not your hobbies. The goal of one's life is to please God. Whether you're alive or dead and you're a spirit in heaven, which is what he's referring to here, whether you are alive on this earth and still living out the physical life, or you are now as a spirit in heaven, the aim, the goal, the place where life should be going day by day by day is to please God. To be pleasing to God. Again, this isn't something Rodney can do for you. Rodney the bozo has to do it for himself. He has to make this assessment of me. But you must make this assessment of you. Just ask the simple question tomorrow. Or, or later this afternoon is fine. Start today. That'd be even better. But make the statement and ask yourself the question. 
Is my life, is my day, is it pleasing to God? Or is it mostly about my pleasures, my job, my family, my stuff? Oh, please, let's not let it be about our stuff. But any of these things are wrong. My hobbies. Is football that important to you that you should miss church? How about your video games? Should you miss church to sit at home playing your video games? I love video games. Why not? Why can't I take every other Sunday off and just have video game day? That's, now we're talking. I could have it right here. I could be playing on the back screen. You guys would never even know. You'd see the controller. But no, of course I don't do that. We shouldn't be doing anything and trading in something that is lesser important for the important things. Does that mean you can never rest or relax? No, nobody's saying that. Does that mean you can't catch a football game from time to time? Nope, nobody's saying that. What we're saying is when you're worshiping that and you're not worshiping God, and those things matter to you and they're on your mind and your heart more often than God's Word and God's people and the Gospel, then yes, I'm saying it and I'm saying it loud and clear. It's wrong. You will never change if you don't stop that nonsense. I know that from personal experience too. And that's no predictor of God's Word. But God's Word is saying it, and I'm telling you through personal example, that I had a huge video game addiction once upon a time. I used to play World of Warcraft sometimes to the neglect of ministry. To the neglect of learning and growing and walking with Christ. I know this from personal experience. I used to practically worship sports. Baseball cards, baseball games, basketball games. Playing and watching. I used to do this stuff as much or more than any of you. I was obsessed. And one day, I had to confront this dummy with those very things. What am I wasting my life on? How many years... And again, you don't have to answer me. I want, I want you to think about this. How many more years do you think you have left of life, if you were to guess? Now, I know we don't know. That is, the point isn't, isn't for you to know the day of your death. The point is, if you were to just give yourself a round number of some sort, how many more years or months would it be? Do you want to spend the next 70 years Playing video games instead of serving God? Yeah. I hope that's the thing for each one of us. That we want the next set of years, whatever those years are, to be lived for God and not for self. We make it our aim, our goal, to be, whether we are present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Is this your life? I'm just going to ask the question simply. And you don't have to answer me. I'm not the judge. I'm purely a mouthpiece. Just like that angel told John when he, when he bent down to worship that angel. Get up and don't do that. I'm not to be worshipped. God is. I'm a mouthpiece. This is his word. So I ask you again, is this your life? If not, why? Please write it down on a piece of paper. If you know good and well that your life is not lived with the aim of pleasing God day in and day out, I want you who say you're a believer to ask yourself, why is it not? Because if there are things impeding you from doing it, what are they? You must identify them. You'll never get rid of them if you don't identify them and you're not honest. What's in the way? And then let me just ask you, as a, as in way of pleading, I think the way that Paul is here with the Corinthian and then and with us too. What is more important than pleasing God? I mean, when you ask it that way, it sounds a little. It, it sounds it, one. It sounds harsh. 
But it also starts to scare us, right? Which I think is exactly the effect Paul is intending to have. And, and you, might be, you might be like, well, again, pastor, you're making this all up and you're putting something in here that doesn't exist. Okay. Apparently, you didn't move forward to read verse 10. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I didn't make it up. And, and in fact, I already read the whole passage to you. Paul is imploring us through the Holy Spirit you have to appear before God someday and you have to answer for what you did in this life, this Christian life. You must answer for the good and the bad. And furthermore, you will receive reward based on how that went, on how your life was lived. Now, can you imagine watching a certain believer walk out and he's shining gloriously and he's got all these crowns. He's got so many crowns they are falling off his head. And he's smiling and excited because he lived a life. And then you walk out and you got a little certificate that says, made it to heaven. No shining glory, no crowns. And I know I'm using a silly example. I have no idea what it's going to look like exactly. But we do know that it says we will receive a reward for those things done in the body. And again, I, I say this to you that if you aren't scared, if there isn't at least a little bit of fear and terror striking your heart right now, then again, you're not listening to the words of the passage. Look at Paul's very next statement. I didn't write this, by the way. All I'm doing is trying to preach it the best I can. Look at verse 11. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord... So you know you have to appear before the judgment seat. There ought to be a great deal of fear and reverence and terror for this experience because God is a just God. God is a holy God. He will not say, I'm okay with what you did. He's not going to say that the sin that you kept committing, that the idleness you kept being in, that the hobbies you put over His Word and His, and his Gospel or whatever, your, your job that you elevated above the church and the body of Christ, he's not going to say, that's okay. No, you may see the anger of an almighty righteous God before you for a moment, as he, who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ad-libbing here on this part, because I don't know all the details of the judgment seat of Christ. But what if the holy God starts to speak to you the way that he did Moses when he was looking at that burning bush? And Moses said, God sent somebody else. I don't speak very well. Who made man's mouth? You know, he may give you some insight into who God is and who you aren't. I'm sure he'll do that with us. The terror of God should be so great in you. The fear of the Lord, if we want to put it in an Old Testament way, should be so great in you. Look at what Paul says. He says, because of this, we persuade men. We persuade men. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to plead with you. I'm trying to get you out of your own rut, your own behavior, and say, hey, wake up. For once in your life, wake up. It's time to look at the truth of who you are and what you're doing. And on the precipice of a new year, there's no better time. Each one of us, and I'm not excluding me. Just because I keep saying you, I'm not excluding me. I have to do this too. I have to do it every day just like you do. What is my life and what am I doing with it? Why did God save me? Was it really so I could watch football every Sunday night? Is that why God put me in the kingdom of God? And again, that, that's just one thing. Or video games. You, I'll use my own sin from the past. It was a huge problem. 
Is that what your life is about? Listen to Matthew 7, 21 through 27, then I'm going to close. I want to preach the rest of it to you, but I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to end with this Matthew 7 thing that we talk about all the time, but I'm going to read the full context and not just that one or two verses that we always reference. Because in Matthew 7, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord is being very clear with those who, whom He's teaching that there will be those who come up to Him in the kingdom and they, ask, they say to Him things like, Lord, we're Yours. We did all these things for You. And there's going to be a little bit of a conversation because it isn't those who say, Lord, Lord. Listen to what God says here. Jesus says here. Listen. He, he paints a very clear picture. Starting in verse 21, Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Is that any more clear? Could, could it be any more clear? It isn't everybody who says, I'm a Christian. It isn't everyone who says, you're my Lord, you're my Lord, or Lord, Lord. It's not everyone saying that who will end up in the kingdom. It's those who do the will of my Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And whether that's Future telling prophecy, if that's the way you want to take it, I don't think that's exactly what he has in mind there. More the forth telling of the word, prophesying and preaching the truth. Whether you did that in the name of Jesus, whether you cast out demons in the name of Jesus, or whether you did many works, many wonders in your name, in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to think about wonders for a second. That sounds like miracles to me. That sounds like Pretty, pretty fancy stuff. But even if you did all of those things, some will come and say, hey, we did that. And then I will declare to them. And this, this is the hard part because sometimes we can be self-deceived. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And, and this is the key, I think. I've got more to read here, but this is the key of the whole thing. There is a group who does the will of God. And there is a group that practices lawlessness. And it doesn't do the will of God. Let's be clear. There are two distinct groups here. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. We talk about this all the time, right? There's one foundation that's laid, and if you, even if you build it on the, on the seashore, if you lay it down on the rock of Christ, it's going to stand, even when the waves and the wind beat on it. But, this is Jesus' word still, verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So he didn't use a foundation. He didn't use the foundation of Christ. He just built the house right on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. You know why? Because that householder was saying he built his house on Christ too. But he didn't. He didn't. He built it right on the sand, on the foolishness of life. He built it right on his pleasures and his job and his family and his, his, his. You hear the repetitive. It's all about me. It's all about self. And he built his life that way. And guess what happened? Well, the whole thing came crumbling down. When the wind and the waves, they came up, the whole house fell. And great is that fall because this person had deceived themselves into believing they had a solid house of faith. They didn't. But the other guy did. The other guy built on the foundation of Christ. He sure did. So, with you, which one are you? 
And you don't even answer me. Again, I'm not the judge. I'm not the judge. I know I'm not the judge. I don't set myself up as the judge. I tell you all the time, don't pattern your life after me. I'm one of you. Pattern your life after the Word of God or Christ Himself. That's the only stable foundation that there is. I'm not the model. But I do have the job of preaching to you and and encouraging you to do what the Bible is saying. So ask yourself, write it down if you can't remember this. Which foundation or which life are you building? The one on the foundation of Christ and it's secure and it's faithful and it's built on the will of God and the commandments of God? Or is it this other one that you're building out of whatever you decide to do day by day by day? Be honest. And if you find find in there that you know you're not real and you've been faking this the whole time, it's not too late to believe. It's not too late to change course and say, man, I surrender to God. I want it to be that way on the rock. It's not too late. At least if you're still drawing breath, it's not too late. So God willing, I hope that each one of us will live a life for God next year. Not a life for Rodney, a life for God. Not a life for self, a life for God. Pray with me. It's in your court. And and you'll notice, I only pointed you to the Scripture and to Christ. I didn't tell you to look at anyone else. I didn't say look at how Cornerstone Grace Church is doing. I said look at yourself in light of what the Bible and Christ have said to you. So you're responsible for those things from here on. You've had the truth taught to you. You won't be able on Judgment Day to say, no one ever shared the truth of that with me. You'll be lying if you try that. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we would be serious about our lives moving forward, that everything we do would be built on the foundation of Christ and your word, that it would all be lived in glory for, in your, for your glory. That, Father, you would receive all the praise. You would receive all the honor. And, God, all these things would move day by day in an increasing way into the image of your dear Son. Father, we pray for the sanctification to continue and for you to continue growing us and weeding out the, the hard and rebellious parts of us and also those places where we've been self-deceived or we've allowed ourselves to get into a rut. Father, I pray that each of us would just back up and start at ground zero and say, hey, I'm going to live for you. So God, I pray that for each person. We pray, Father, that you would bless and that you would move us in that exact way. And pray that the gospel, we pray that the gospel would go out from this place in a magnificent way so many would believe. And Father, that you would receive the glory in our whole community. We love you and praise you. Father, we thank you for this year and we ask for your blessings on the new year. We pray that they will be truly lived for you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.